thanks for carving out some time to chat. Of course. <laughs> thanks for asking. <laughs> you bet. Well, well, you passed along that book and and I, I was like, oh, wow, this is such a cool way to present uh, intonation. And then you know, a bunch of copies have sold in our sheet music store. I thought like, and I was talking to my, my business partner, Trevor, and we're like, <laughs> he's like, you should talk to Molly about the topic. And because it's obviously, it obviously connects with people. And the way that you laid it out against the open strings is just a really... Um, a practical way. So I get, I get that it connects, but thanks for putting that together. It's really sure. Cool. Yeah. I, I, that's what exactly what I wanted to is something so practical um, to apply that. And, and again, with open strings, so you really can just focus on it because there is, I hadn't found anything that was that specific. I mean, there are, there are books about it, but they're talking about how to figure the ratios and the syntonic commas and like, that doesn't yeah. help, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's it's super it's super uh, tangible and applicable. And like, it's a really, yeah. So congrats mm -hmm. on taking yeah, something that, that could, it's one of those things that like, yeah, I've played music since I can remember. And that's still like, I think just intonation. I'm like, wait, what is that? How does that work? And um, so, but it's a really um, uh, just immediately, immediately applicable way of thinking about it. Yeah, well, I, th I think there are a lot of things in classical music actually that are assumed. Mm -hmm. As, and people assume that, well, you'll eventually hear it or you'll eventually learn how to do it. And there's a lot of oral tradition that like you learn by having, you know, chamber music, by having coachings and learning how to do that. But I, I've, and so I don't know, I kind of like to fill the gaps between kind of the, what we're assumed to know <laughs> and then making them just spelling them out. I don't know why people haven't done it before, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love that you that you turned the that at least with this this version of it to, to bass players, you know. And oh my I, gosh! I, I, I sort of forgot you weren't a bass player, and then I'm looking, and it's like, oh wait, there's an awful lot of viola in these email addresses and websites. So yes, congrats on what you're doing generally. It's funny. What is it in the water at Virginia Commonwealth that that produces these like entrepreneurial <laughs> people like you? And I've had Susanna. Susanna? Yeah, I've heard yeah. her on the podcast a couple of times, I, and <laughs> I, I think. Actually, Actually, we get together and talk about this kind of stuff. So it's like we have our little uh, artistic entrepreneurial support group, <laughs> which is really fun. That's yeah. awesome. That's so, awesome. I mean, I she's helped me tons and just having someone to bounce ideas off. And I mean, we talk about everything from how do you actually use MailChimp to like what's blocking me? Why can't I get this out or whatever? You know, it's like either really philosophical or sometimes just really <laughs> nuts and bolts. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, yeah, I wrote this for viola. I'm mm -hmm. a violist. Mm -hmm. And then I made a violin version and then a cello. And then I thought, well, I should make a bass version. And um, it hurt my brain because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think in fourth. So actually, can I give a shout out to the bass players who helped me with this? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, Andrew Summer, who's uh, my colleague, he's principal bass in Richmond, um, helped me. Uh, my friend Claude Arthur, who... Um, I know through the pop and jazz world, um, I, I mean, literally, I would say, can you play these two notes together? Does, or how would you do that? And then Brian Powell at University of Miami r did a really thorough read and just helped me tremendously and tried things and experimented. Nick Myers from Detroit Symphony and Jonathan Borden from Buffalo Phil. So without those, with their help and, and guidance, you know, I, I was really grateful. So wow you did some some real field testing there on the on this one that's really cool I, yeah i did not want to put it out there without having lots of base eyes on it and trying it yeah for sure yeah i guess i would i would be a little trepidatious if i was going to put out something into the viola or violin world especially the violin world yeah oh yeah <laughs> but, yeah wow I, at some point i think we have to talk about i think basses and violas like like our little communities like you have the bass community i kind of viola community is kind of my thing i can't really find a violin community or a cello community to sell this book in it's it's a whole different thing so i think there's some commonalities here oh yeah well what's the line they say you know, at least with basis we have we have conventions and violinists have competitions uh, you know but, same but but it is cool I, i've had you probably had many more conversations with Susanna about this but i've had some you know just like it's cool to see what she's doing in the violin world and there's um uh renee paul gautier started a pie I 
mean, there are some people. She's got a podcast called Mind Over Finger about mm-hmm. mindful practice. And then like Nathan Cole and L.A. Phil, what he's done. So yeah. there are some people. I, I always chalk it up to, and this is like, this is a joke really, but it's like there's so many more notes to learn in the like <laughs> first violin section than like the bass section. Not on this guy. I'm, I'm subbing with San Francisco this week and we've got a, a horrifically challenging uh, trombone concerto premiere. So I have just, yeah. and, the, and it's, I have just as many notes as anybody this week, but generally, you know, I think we just have mm-hmm. a little more space, but I, yeah, it's interesting. I think that there's, there is a lot in common between the viol and the bass world. That's what I found. And just looking at your community and, and, um, and I'm, and talking to bases in my section, I'm like, Hey, do you know, Jason Heath? I'm like, yeah, everyone is like, <laughs> sure. And you know, they, anyway, I love it. I, it, cello is confusing though, isn't it? Because you would think that, because if you look at like the low brass world, those, the lower the instrument, the more sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, c- community oriented maybe, I'm generalizing, but you know, if you look at like trombone, tuba, certainly. Isn't there like a tuba, the, the brotherhood of tuba? I don't know. There's some yeah. like. Right. Yeah, there's some, yeah. there's some, like we have the International Society basis. The tuba world has something very similar. There's this, there's mm-hmm. this tuba Armageddon thing that, that happens uh, <laughs> at, I think it's in, it used to be in Chicago, or at least one year was in Chicago, but it was like they would get together for tuba holiday. So it was like, how many tubists could you fit into Symphony Center in Chicago? You could fit a lot. <laughs> yeah, impressive. Well, yeah, you're talking about cellos. I think it's true. Like our cello section gets along so well, and they just love and respect each other. Um, so that's true. But, but yet again, where's the cello convention? Actually, there must be one. I don't know. Is there? I, I uh, may not that I've heard of, but uh, yeah. but I know that viol. I there's. I mean, with bass. I, the line again these are just jokes but there's a little bit of truth to them we're like one step away from looking ridiculous on the base <laughs> so i think we we tend not to take ourselves too seriously um like you know back mm-hmm. when i taught high school I, just for fun i put up a little thing that said viola jokes in the orchestra room and you the 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 the, the vile stuff that came out of these like high school kids like i thought oh nobody has any viola jokes so i you know maybe maybe we have something in common there. Um, I don't know, though. I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, and, and the entrepreneurial thing I've thought about a lot because, mm-hmm. and part of this could be my own bias because I talk to so many bass players, but I think like, why are so many bass players starting other things? And I don't know if you thought about that with violists or are there a lot of other violists? Do you find people kind of... Yeah, there's... Well, let's see. Like, I, th- I don't know if you know about viola-centric. They're, um, they're, they have I'm a podcast. So yeah, I'm, do. I, okay. <laughs> Because it, the podcast, it, even though it's viola centric and it's hosted by two violists, um, is not just about viola. It's about the freelancing lifestyle, how things that are antiquated, how the pandemic affected. I mean, they're talking about really cool things, and they're they're definitely you know artist entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, I think I think violas again, maybe because you have to hustle a little bit for even for repertoire, you know. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, there's something know. there too, right? With the repertoire mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, there's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna listen. I, I, I'm gonna take out and walk my dog after we get done talking. <laughs> so I'll listen to that. And that's sort of like the dirty secret of my podcast is I like I barely ever talk about bass on it at all. It's just a nice niche, you know. It's yeah. like we're we're bass players, but we it's talk I, about all everything. Rarely do we <laughs> talk about strings. Sometimes, yes. but you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, th- I th- we could talk about whatever, but oh, and by, since we're talking about podcasts, um, have you ever checked out the Per Service podcast? I don't know that that's happening anymore, but mm, that's I one that I, I uh, Michael uh, O'Giblin was that the name of it? But it was a really fun podcast because it was four. I think they were all violinists. Maybe one of them was a violist, but they were all freelancers, and it was all about like the trials and tribulations mm-hmm. of being a freelancer. And they did it for several years. I don't think they're still doing because I haven't seen. In my feed but it was fun to kind of mm-hmm. follow along with their careers as that like one of one of the violinists she got on the uh, uh she started playing hamilton in new york oh my gosh and yeah. then like the the just the whole balancing that and what if this show dries up and then i have to say no to the other gigs and so it's really i love i love i will i will i'm sure i will love and continue to follow along with viola centric it sounds like yeah i think you'll like it yeah with the freelance world there's a lot of uh calculating and strategy and it's yeah it's it's um 
yeah, I've come to see that it really is a whole different ball uh, ball game. And um, and I also like they talk a lot about this too. It's like consciously building your freelance life because we're we never learn to say no. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like you take every gig, and then after a while, you reach a point where you're like, do I really have to take everything? And what what am I going for here? And also trusting that I will continue to get work if I say no to this thing and Mm -hmm. yeah i feel lucky to not really you know having a full-time orchestra job i don't have to um really worry like that however i i you know i tell it i've learned to understand the whole freelance thing yeah and more well here's an interesting let me just bring this up because these podcasts will probably come out at about the same time but i was talking to so having a full-time job i was just talking to a wonderful bassist named ali cook who she subbed in like every big orchestra practically she like played extended contracts in in the national symphony and played in everything and what came and she actually just decided within the last six months or so to quit it all and move to austin and become a singer songwriter which she kind of had in the back of her head but she had developed this career as like a long-term sub and just the challenge and and i never really thought about that because i've done that I'm, do, I'm doing that this week in san francisco but like there's there's this added level of wanting to fit in at all costs you know it's like it's like you know generally when you're playing in a section being creative is a liability you know and, <laughs> yes and then even more so i think and it never really occurred to me but when you're subbing so you know i'm sure you have lots of people in in that boat in richmond but like like i it, it is kind of interesting if that's if that becomes like what you do that's sort of like there's like an, an added level of like you know maybe they'll never call me again mm-hmm. and i'm doing this good work but it could disappear at any time. So you're like trying to fit in anyway, but you're trying to like fit in on this like additional level. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's tricky. And, and um, with the fitting in and the, I, I've had people, you know, contact me and say, I had to say no two times in a row. Am I, do you think I'm going to be off the list? And I mean, for me, it's like, no, it, you're not off the list because you weren't available. But I'm sure that some places, maybe that's how it is. So yeah, you kind of have to, know who you're working with and i would think as a freelancer like really relationships matter even more <laughs> but i don't i don't know it just every orchestra works differently and every any you on know, church gigs and whatever right but, and, and, the, and I, the weird the weird little lesson of my life not that i don't know if this applies to anybody is i was so worried back in like 2004 2005 i was getting called as playing lyric opera i was playing i was playing a lot of good work and i was so worried about fitting in and then i finally consciously decided i was like i gotta do something else with my life mm-hmm. uh and my wife was going to medical school and so i i decided i tried to set fire to my career i started writing about how much how unsatisfying that work was and everything i thought no one will ever call me again but i Ironically, I think, and I don't know, again, I don't know if there's a lesson in here or not, but I, but I actually, if you look at my resume, my career, the more I quit caring and trying to fit in, the better work I've gotten. So like I started t- teaching at DePaul and I started getting called, you know, by the top groups in town more. And I think it was just, I became more interesting. <laughs> well, I, I think that's an argument for authenticity is they, yeah. people, I think, which is, you know, the, the people talking about today, it's, um, yeah, being authentic and hoping that that's, and I guess trusting that really, if you really do show up as yourself, that's actually what people want. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, there's a quote that I really love um, by a woman who's actually a, I think she's a co- CEO coach, a coach for CEOs, like they call her the CEO whisperer. But she has this thing that says, like um, when she starts feeling insecure about her work, whatever, that I am invited to the right things. And by showing up, you know, with opinions, with knowledge, who I am fully, I am invited to the right things. And I just, uh, your experience kind of speaks to that as well, but it can be scary. And, but also it's, you know, in my twenties, would I have said no to the stuff like that? No, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can remember at a point where I finally started, like, I have to say no to something because it's too much. But I think everyone hits that point and then you kind of have to make a decision. Like, which way am I going to go? Because some of that, some of that stuff of our 20s is not sustainable. 
Yeah, for sure. It's funny having a couple go arounds on like freelancing in good groups and stuff. It's funny when I started to get called by the symphony here and I'm, I'm thankful that they call. Thank you. Please getting called. But part of me, I went and played the first week and I felt like, oh, no, I don't want to want this, which is kind of a weird thing. But it's like great work. But I don't I've spent so much of my life wanting to 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 do, you know, just hungering for s stuff and having a scarcity mindset. And I've been mm -hmm. enjoying my more abundance mindset and that kind of yes. thing. And, and as soon as I got there, I was like, uh oh, how do I get called for more of this? It's like, oh, I see. Yeah. Again, you know, it's so like I don't want to want I, I, I mean, yeah, it's the managing expectations kind of thing, I guess. Right. Yeah, I'm impressed. But you, um, the woman you mentioned who is now going to Austin mm -hmm. and that's a big that's a big leap of faith. That's awesome, though. It's a big. Yeah. It was something that she'd been thinking about for a while, and I think the fact that all of a sudden you have 18 months of no work is probably a good time for self-reflection. And she yes, it was very on. clarifying, or as some people said, it's an accelerant for <laughs> <laughs> what you were going to do or not do. Yeah, well, for sure. And, and it was interesting. This is kind of a weird observation, but I've sort of been doing my own thing for a while, and I've sort of, I sort of pandemic proofed myself in a way um, inadvertently, but but. Um, it was really interesting to watch all these people that never really had to think about doing other stuff and to see what some of them at least did do. And you take these people that are really world class at what they do and to just see, oh, what if they do uh, enter that entrepreneurial sort of think thinking for a while? What, you know? And so I saw some really cool projects. And then my next observation I'm making now is like, how many, once the work comes back, how many of them are going to keep doing that a little bit or going to totally drop it? And right. Yeah. Yes, it's a good question. And, um, you know, I feel like I was not pandemic proof, but I had taken, so let's see, the 2018-19 season, I took a sabbatical, mm -hmm. uh, or I call it my adapt, adult gap year, because sabbatical <laughs> implies productivity. But I would played 25 seasons, and I needed a break. And just, and so I... Uh, after our last concert, suddenly I was looking at 13 months of like zero on my calendar. And I have to say it was hard. <laughs> I was, I, so I kind of struggled at, at first with how do I fill my time? What do I want to be doing? How, so I learned how I work best. What's, what works for me in terms of the, the perfect day, how many projects, what different kind of projects. So it was, um, uncomfortable at the beginning. I also got, um, a lot more comfortable with solitude because <laughs> I had a lot of time and everyone else was busy do, doing their lives. And, you know, I did travel and that kind of stuff. So I came, came back for the 2019-2020 season and then March 2020, pff, nothing. And so it was kind of like, oh, I I trained for this or, you know, I was able to, to actually like do things immediately because I just... And the the good thing was not good thing, but one of the silver lining things is everyone else had nothing to do. So you could call anyone and be like, "Hey, do you want to collaborate on this? Or you want to do this?" I'm like, yes, <laughs> sure. So it, I met I met more people and did more networking during the pandemic, and so yeah, yeah. So, but if I hadn't had that sabbatical experience and and figured it out, I I don't know. It would have been a totally different experience for me. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that that was the easiest year of booking guests I've ever had on my podcast. Yes. Everybody, everybody was no available. No doubt. But it's funny yeah. though. It, 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 it and it sounds like you went through thinking through that. Get when you do get a break, because like when I was freelancing and everything, I was working seven days a week, like so many people, and I would just have the. T it wasn't necessarily the time that was optimal for me to work. It was just the time there was, you know. Yeah. And I, w I started up my blog and podcast and all that business while I was freelancing and doing all that. But I've got, I've learned like what times work best for me for creative yes. projects. So, Same. so so what what's your I, I think it's interesting just how people work like what's an optimal uh my perfect you know? day yeah <laughs> my perfect day would be i would naturally wake up well rested at about <laughs> seven <laughs> and then um i like to spend about probably an hour and a half to two hours i, I start with like my tea and, and, and journaling mm -hmm. and then at some point the journaling moves from kind of internal processing to the things I'm curious about. And then I can kind of follow whatever I'm kind of interested in. 
at the moment mm -hmm. and then and then have breakfast and then um, I'm definitely a morning practicer or morning worker so maybe getting to my room by like 9 30 and doing you know and this is the perfect world so I do a half hour of yoga and stretching and warming up and then practicing uh, and then the afternoon would be for either something else like art projects or some kind of something else or being outside and then around five o'clock you wind it down and um, have happy hour and then cook dinner together with friends and that's kind of the perfect day <laughs> yeah th that sounds pretty close to my perfect day that was a day that i like never lived when i was freelancing it was like once oh yeah moved, i'm a lot closer one of the things that moving to san francisco where it's like generally nice out all the time i, I used to love trying to go running or whatever but i it would always be too hot or too cold or too icy i remember some january in chicago i went out and it was like 10 degrees and dark and i'm running and I'm, i came home and i thought like i feel worse than if i hadn't gone to <laughs> yeah my, my new thing, I try at least once a week, sometimes it's two or three times a week. I live in on the north side of like the northeast corner of San Francisco and I take the dog and some coffee and my iPad Pro and I do this 10 mile loop. And in the middle of it, I'm sitting in the park staring at the Golden Gate Bridge. And I think like, oh, I'm looking at the Golden Gate Bridge and I'm checking my email. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, do, I do some journaling on the iPad Pro and that kind of thing. And I really like at least, I, like I'm, I didn't do that today. I just woke up and started talking on Zoom um, but but at least a few days a week, that's like a great reset and outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I'll bring my camera sometimes and photograph my goofy dog running along. And that's a good way to kind of get things going. It's like a ton of exercise. And then I get home and I'm feeling ready to go. And mm -hmm. I wish I could do it every day. But, uh, you know, I do it as often as I can. Yeah. Getting outside, I have to do it every day for yeah. sure. Or I start. Yeah. It's not good for me not to, so. Well, that, that helped me. I mean, you live in a more doable climate for that mm -hmm. than like Chicago. Chicago is yes. rough, especially when I was, I, I had seven years where I was teaching high school full time. So it'd be dark when I left, dark when I came home. Ugh. And so what I would do is every Saturday, I, I this is when I was teaching at DePaul, I would walk from my place to DePaul, which is about three miles and then I would meet up with my wife and we would do some other long walks. So we'd get out like seven, eight miles and and but I, I noticed an immediate change in my mood and my productivity, frankly, mm -hmm. and just like mm -hmm. the quality of my life. <laughs> when, yeah. When I moved out here and and stopped commuting that much. I, I don't know how people survive like that polar vortex when it was like minus 40 i don't even how in the world that's insane i, I, I think you just get used to what's around you I right? guess. Like, like i wouldn't even think about that it's just like all right it's cold like i remember one day oh. before i moved i woke up and i would this is we had a year where my wife moved out here and i was still in chicago and i would do this 10 mile walk to my favorite brewery in town it was like a 10 <laughs> mile straight walk and i knew if i left at 7 30 it would be right when it opened and i would get brunch and hang and then like and and one day i woke up and it was like the only outdoor time I would get. I woke up, it was like February, and, and I looked at the high, and the high was zero. And I thought like, oh, uh, but I, I put on my snow pants, my serious boots, my face mask, my scar, and, and I got moving. And those days, it, it's so cold that it's like actually kind of beautiful when you go out because it's so crystal clear, and then like nobody's out. But I will take this climate any day over there. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. if you don't mind, I would love to have a, a very nerdy conversation. Yeah. If you do, <laughs> about, Let's do it. Okay. What, again, this is a big question that you've thought a lot about. What is just intonation? <laughs> okay. So um, as string players, we have a choice on where to place a note, unlike say piano. <laughs> Uh, so there are different tuning systems and as music evolved and got more complicated, they ha you know, had to think about tuning and intonation differently. So if you look, listen to medieval music, it's got lots of fourths and fifths and octaves. And so as music evolved, they had to kind of ad address it uh, because things would, if you went too far from that, it would just sound so god awful out of tune. <laughs> okay, so um, the other thing is, I think singers probably more naturally would sing in what we would call just intonations because you're really just intonation to me is going for the maximum resonance in an interval. And so 
Um, if you're constantly tuning, now people is tuned to a tuner and sometimes are following, watching the needle for straight up and down. That's not the most resonant. It might sound kind of like in tune, but is it the most in tune? And if you hear qu string quartets or qu choirs that are singing with really great intonation like that, I mean, there's like ex so much extra resonance and, and sound and intonation are linked. So if you want to work on your intonation work on your sound if you want to work on your sound work on your intonation but you know they they really do inform one another so um yeah so just intonation is is i mean it, it's working also with the laws of acoustics and physics and with ratios and that's the part where personally i don't really care mm -hmm. just because i can calculate it or you know, it's, can you apply it? Can you hear it? So this, this book, I wanted to do it because also what it, it talks about double stops and just intonation, but really what it's about is working on your sound. Mm -hmm. It's working on how to slow down, broaden your awareness. It's like a mindfulness practice, really slow down and actually to listen to what's actually happening. And then I'm guiding you so you can put, you know, you can put your finger right where it needs to be and then just listen and maybe play around with tuning it like you would with a microscope and like, yeah, it's pretty clear, but can I get it even more locked in? And when you become aware of what that not only sounds like when the sound goes from like, wah, to like deeper, but also feels like is your instrument vibrating and stuff. Um, I think that's interesting, but you have to know what you're going for in order to then make choices in the future about it. But this is so this book is really uh, more of a systematic way not only to practice intonation but how to teach intonation because we'll we'll tell our students like you know this is really out of tune go practice with a drone I'll see you next week you know and maybe you don't have time to say okay the minor second actually can be in tune if you do it you know a little bit wider than blah so um, I guess I guess we're starting from what is possible and then you know, then there's, of course, expressive intonation or melodic intonation, but at least you can make educated choices or know how to compromise. I don't know, it just gives you more tools. But I think the greatest tool from doing this is the awareness. And that's our job as teachers is to, you know, like <laughs> have the more, <laughs> um, you're able to kind of take in more information and, and what's possible. So and starting with those open strings. I mean, it's like a beautiful way to do it. And that's, 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 uh, I think, I think part of why this has been resonating, at least with the, the folks in, in, in my base world mm -hmm. is, is yeah. Like, like you, you, you just feel like you're sliding around and not knowing what to do. And, and like you said, go, go practice with the drone. Well, what does that mean? And then, you know, I, my, I have a one, I use tonal energy on my iPhone. It's this great app and I can switch between, but it's like, there's so much information coming at you. It's one of those yes. things that can get. And so I think, I think the way that you presented it for I'm sure for all the string instruments but definitely in this base book it's just so applicable it's just like do this listen to this listen to how it goes listen to the sound and that's it's yeah it, it really is like this beautiful tone development exercise along with an ear training exercise and how to make double stops sing that's a great uh su you know <laughs> subtitle thanks. as well thanks yeah um it's funny because you know I had a lot of people kind of proof it and read it and um they said, wow, I actually learned some things. You know, people, I've been playing for 30 years professionally. I learned some things. Did you learn this in school? I'm like, no, that's why I'm writing this. I didn't really. I mean, you'd have quartet practice and they're like, you need, you know, the chords aren't in tune. Kind of tweak this down or maybe tweak that up. But I, I just wanted to lay it out there in the simplest, and I'll, to, yeah, just make it as simple and, and a, be able to apply it as possible so when did the idea to actually systematize it like that happen? because i think oh. a lot of us me included i'm like oh i should write something about <laughs> yeah. that and i have some in some archive well, probably at my mom's house you know like some right. version of a base book that never went anywhere but actually this is a an offshoot of a pandemic project so uh i'll give you the, the slightly long version since please we're on the <laughs> podcast um so 10 days after the lockdown started, I think March 23rd or something, I started this um, virtual viola warm-up group. And we met every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour um, online for like five months or five or six months. And this is violists from 
actually all over the world. We had someone from Australia who it was like the last thing she did before she went to bed. And then we had people on the West Coast who were up at seven and we did 20 minutes of yoga, like stretching. We were all warming up how you should, but you never have time to. So we would stretch 20 minutes and then we would literally do just the basics. Start with open strings, do a left-hand thing, then do some scales. And I had prompts and things. I Everyone one was muted. So it was just a great, because we were all needing st- structure community at that point and I think right now we forget how in those first couple of months it was just so jarring so anyway we met so I was always trying to think of content and things to do Um, and so I just basically would do like one at some point I just started doing like one interval per like with this system and then we would do like some double stop etude that had lots of six in it or whatever uh, and so people really liked it. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And I had kind of, I had worked on um, talking about making the kind of oral tradition into something that's cod- codified. Um, I had been working on a, like a string quart- quartet 101 book on literally how to cue and just the basic nuts and bolts that no one has ever spelled out. And I had this intonation chapter in there about tuning intervals, because if everyone in the quartet understands how to tune intervals, it will be so much easier to tune chords in quartet. So I kind of pulled that out, used it in this, people really liked it. So that's when I thought, well, maybe instead of putting it as part of the quartet book, I should just have this, um, try it. So I, I made the viola book, then I did the viol- the violin and cello, because my I guess my thinking is that if everyone in the quartet did this book, you could come to rehearsals and have a lot of shortcuts because you have the same vocabulary and understanding. So that's kind of how that came to be. And, and actually it's been popular with the viola community and then um, surprisingly with the bass community. Well, it's really love. interesting um, adapting it to fourths, right? Because that's like the big, the big change. Where, oh, did it, did yeah. any of the feedback you get from all those wonderful, you had like a wonderful list of bass players that proved it. Was any of the feedback like, oh, huh, that's surprising. Were there any like takeaways or? Um, the main thing I heard back, because I had already gone to two bases to kind of figure out which exercise to include. And so I guess things I got back were, I don't even know if you should put that in. It's too low to even really hear, <laughs> like on the bottom strings. Like, I don't know. Uh, the other thing is the way I realized the way we t- talk about sounding point, like on the viola, I was like, closer to the bridge, closer to the bridge, you get a focus sound. And the bass players are like, that doesn't actually really work. So it was, it, I. that's the thing that was rewritten. I think probably the most is about sound, how to create it because it's different in bass land. And then what intervals to include, because like, can you, anyone but elephants actually hear this? You know? <laughs> it's a de- that's a demo I've done for so many students. It's like, I'll play my open A and E string. It's like, why, when the question is asked, why do you tune with harmonics? It's say, listen to this. And I play my open A and E strings. I say, I've been playing bass 30 some years. I can't hear if that's, a t- I mean, it just sounds like exactly. mud. And so, but, at the same time, one does need to be able to play G on the E string in tune. And if you've ever gone into a not so awesome orchestra, you're going to hear some truly, <laughs> truly heinous crimes being committed. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I actually had had one of the bass players. We do an experiment, and like, I want you to tune with harmonics, and with the really everything like straight up and down, and then check your open strings, and then do it conversely. Like, is there any difference? And I don't think. There might have been a little bit, but not really. I was wondering if it was going to be, you know, how much cha- difference it would be, but. It, um, it, it is interesting though, and I'll tell you, I've noticed a shift over the years. Like if I go back to when I was, and maybe it's just because I played with better groups, but but if I go back to like when I was in my mid twenties, uh, just I I almost never saw a tuner break out on stage. But these days, I see like when I like I go like backstage Wednesday at, at the S- San Francisco Symphony, every everybody will have either their phone or a tuner out, and they'll tune their open strings, not yes. the harmonics like I was taught. 
And I don't know if part of that is the fact that we all have extensions and there's like a whole bunch of like, you know, tuning an extension is not that big a deal, but it's like another element you're right, yeah. adding in and mine sticks. And so it's like, it, it, I'll turn and it won't move and then it'll jump a <laughs> yeah. half step. And so <laughs> yes. it's like a giant project, but I have noticed that. And, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, that subbing thing, it's like, well, if everybody else is doing this and then I'm not, mm -hmm. and something's out of tune and I'm the sub, it's like, right. Pretty well, clear who's at fault. Well, for, for me and for cellists, like if we don't, if we don't tune really tight fists with the G and the C up, we're going to sound so flat and orchestras, as you know, go high anyway. So, um, <laughs> so my, the, the principal cellist in Richmond and we, we did this, we called it, we said that we're going to do the stay and play pact. Like we're going to tune our tight fists, but you know, we can't be tuning our C strings like super high. And so um, actually our orchestra is pretty good at keeping the pitch down, but we really, if you didn't do tight fists, it would just be not not good. <laughs> yeah, it's something I've noticed because I remember hearing, and there are many prominent bass players that advocate for tight fourths too, or like a little bit, like just yeah. a little sharp, especially on the E string. And I can I can remember, uh, assuming my memory is correct, so many times where I would have to like jack that E string up a little bit, and maybe yes. th maybe it's a change in in uh, taste over time, or maybe I, again maybe I'm just playing with better groups. But I find that like like if I just like dial in E at 440, you know, with A442 yes. or whatever, that's yep. pretty, pretty much consistently where, where mm -hmm. at least, you know, the yeah. symphony here is staying at. Yeah. I think the other reason I wanted to do this book for students is because, you know, I didn't, we didn't really use electronic tuners all the time. Like when I was learning to tune your instrument, you literally just learned how to hear every, the intervals. And now, I mean, every kid learns to, to tune by with a tuner and the needle straight up and down and like how much are you really processing other than try to match. So I, this is a, a thing to, in a, a little bit to get away from that and thinking that just because the needle straight up and down, it's in tune, but also to get away from the visual only and really listen, because I don't, I don't have proof that it never like always having a tuner in your life since you started playing what that does. But I think, I don't know. I think mindfulness and more awareness is always a good thing. But. Yeah, I hear you 100%. And, and, and you're making my brain turn to like thinking about student bass players or bass players in like an educational setting. A lot. And I, I have a clinic I've done a bunch of times uh, at various music education conferences. Something along the lines of why do my basses sound like that? It's like advice for non bassists about why their basses sound like trash, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, like anybody who's conducted any uh, student ensemble, certainly, it's like you, you get to a, uh, uh, a chord or something or you get to I don't know whatever like a G chord and and it's like all right this sounds bad let's isolate violins viola cello bass or maybe you should start with bass but you get to bass and it's like you're not even remotely on G you're like on F maybe and and then okay wait just play your open strings oh you're like a whole step flat you know and yeah and part of that uh, I and I don't know exactly why, frankly, part of that I think is, yeah, just not developing your ear. Part of that is the fact that the bass is so low. And then if I'm talking about students, that's another thing, but there's mm -hmm. this bass player thing. Again, I maybe spend too much time in the world of bass, so I might be biased or probably am biased, but like, I kind of feel like bass, bass students, especially at the like high school level, if they're not careful, they just kind of stop paying attention to the sound coming out of their instrument. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, maybe that's true among all string players, but I certainly noticed that with bass players where it's like, you're not even getting the fundamental. Um, and mm. I, I don't know why that is. Uh, part of it's maybe that it's a more challenging instrument to get the fundamental. Part of it's that it's so low. Maybe it's that they don't uh, mm -hmm. develop the ear like that, but. And in a classroom situation, like, is there even time to go into that? That's the thing. It's like, I mean, I'm, I don't do classroom teaching, so I don't know, but I can imagine that it would be hard to hit all the marks with all the the players. Yeah, but. and that's the sort of things like in an ideal world, maybe no tapes for anybody, certainly after a certain point. But when I taught high school, we got those <laughs> tapes and those bases. Because... Yeah, you, you got to at least start somewhere, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I'm sure as also basis on a viola, like our functions in the harmony are different. Like your, you know, root Mm -hmm. most you know often we're listening down to you and and as a violist i'm 
middle in the middle somewhere. So um, I'm sure my my intonation is very flexible, but I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that I feel like I spend half my time working on intonation, the other half's playing out of tune. But you know, <laughs> but our roles in the orchestra are a little different, you know. So which is right. Yeah, there's a flexibility, like just by the nature of the inner voice that like the fundamental or the 16 foot octave or whatever, you know, is, is mm -hmm. not going to have. But it's interesting. I mean, thinking about that whole visual thing in the tuner, just uh, like uh, something happened in the bass world about... 20 years ago, 18 years ago, when Edgar Meyer came out with this album and it had dots all over his bass. And all of a sudden it's like permission was given to put dots on your bass. And I saw dots on mm -hmm. so many bases in professional orchestras. And, and then, and I put some dots. I like got, they had this little like way to put, put them at, mm -hmm. and, and, and then I bought, but, but I got, they became a crutch like crazy. And I would freak out if I didn't have, or I was borrowing a bass and I was like, oh, and I found myself drawing pencil lines. And then mm -hmm. I got the, base that you can probably see in the corner there and I just didn't want to like do anything to it so I just said I'm just not ever going to put marks on this and I think I started like trusting my ear a little bit more but it was an adjustment and I'm not sure if the dots were a positive for me quite frankly mm. but I think they're fine for some people yeah it's an interesting yeah. topic though yeah I've seen some people putting some dots on and like I mean I think if you're a seasoned professional and you're you're under the gun at weekend and week week after week to produce hey go for it you know i'm not i'm certainly not judging if i could see him on my viola fingerboard maybe i should do that but it's kind of hard to see <laughs> yeah part, part but... of that is the, is the <laughs> angle right for bass players. right and, and and even though like i say that but if i had to find like a high f natural on the g string in an orchestral setting i would break up that pencil no problem oh yeah man I <laughs> yeah, I, I borrowed, um, and, and the thing I tell bass players is like, let's just use all the senses. This is challenging enough. Like if, if, yeah. if, if smell or taste helps somehow throw those in, certainly yeah. hear, you know, the, the kinesthetic feeling and, and then visual, um, you know. And if it helps you sound like Edgar Meyer, all the better, right? Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I love it. Uh, how, if you got a couple more minutes, uh, how, how would you t take me on your journey? How'd you get to be doing what you're doing? Like, did, did you start on viola? Where'd you go? I up? did start on viola. Oh, so awesome. okay. Yeah. I'm a, one of those rare ones, but, um, yeah, I grew up, uh, I was born in Fayetteville, Arkansas and, um, my grandmother played piano. My mother played piano and organ. So I, I grew up listening to classical music and, um, I started playing viola in my public school program, actually, and I went, I couldn't wait because I think you couldn't start until fifth grade, and I just always wanted to play, and, and I started piano because I think my mom was a pianist. She thought I was going to play a piano, so I played piano from about kindergarten to fourth grade, and then finally I got to start, and I went to the teacher and said, I'd like a violin. She said, oh, we're all out of violins. How about a viola? I'm like, okay, and I don't think they were out of violins. I think she needed a violist and she was a violist. Um, but it was, again, I think the universe making the correct, the right choice. Cause I really am a violist. So mm -hmm. it's like, I don't want to play fast. I just want to play pretty. You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, I started taking lessons and then it's, uh, Fayetteville is a university town. And so all through high school, I was playing in the university orchestra and the community orchestra which was together and having lessons there. But at the time I thought I was going to be a vet. So it was just, I did music and then I was going to be a vet. So I started college, uh, at a small liberal arts college majoring in biology. And I really missed music. And I think even more, I missed my tribe, <laughs> which were musicians. Mm -hmm. So, um, the middle of my sophomore year, um, I decided to kind of go for it and ch switch to music. So I transferred to Blair School of Music at Vanderbilt sure. and studied with Catherine Plummer there. And then after graduated from Vanderbilt, I went to Cleveland Institute for a master's with Heidi Castleman. And that was awesome. And um, spent a summer with uh, Bob Vernon, mm -hmm. which was really great for my playing too. Um, and then I started a DMA and I don't know what, sometimes a DMA is a place where you land while you take auditions. Sure. <laughs> so, so you get a job. <laughs> so I was there one semester and then I m l used the next semester I wasn't in school and, and just practiced uh, excerpts and took some auditions and that's how I ended up in Richmond, Virginia. 
Right. So, and it's been a, it's a good fit for me. Um, cause it's Richmond is big enough to have a professional orchestra. Um, but small enough, there's not the traffic of Northern Virginia and I kind of live out in the country and it's, um, so I, I don't know. I, I like it here. It's been a good fit and being principal here, I get, you know, a lot of opportunity and a lot of variety. So yeah. I do get to do chamber music, had a quartet for 20 something years and, and it was a residency and I teach, I'm adjunct at Virginia Commonwealth University. So I get a lot of variety from chamber music to, we do a lot of chamber orchestra and then we do a lot of big orchestra. So I'm all about the variety. I'm kind of a generalist in general. <laughs> I like, I have to, and I have to have a lot of out, you know, um, the orchestra is not responsible for your happiness. <laughs> so orchestral musicians have to take it upon themselves. You have to, for me, I have to have other projects outside of, sometimes outside of music, but on the side for my own well-being. So I've, I've I guess I've kind of, kind of always done that. I don't know, but this art, kind of this entrepreneurial stuff is, is a nice something different also it's nice to have something tangible that you do because being a performer like you other than recordings which i'm not going to go back and listen to yeah it's like you don't you know you don't have anything tangible so that's i guess that's kind of my story yeah you know it's beautiful it's it's something that i've learned it's like i have a, a long list i should put to, of like lessons learned from 860 podcasts or something and one that i learned early on from my my teacher in, in college one of the chicago symphony based was michael of he's like he's like you you Everybody who hasn't completely died inside in the professional orchestra world has something that outside of the of the job, whether maybe it's music, maybe it's not that that really lights their fire, and then they take yeah. that to the gig. And and for so like I, I I think about that a lot with the San Francisco Symphony bass players. Everybody has something that they're that they're really into, and it's it's um and it's yeah it's just kind of interesting to think about how how and. and and you might not think that when you're at, on the outside. You, you yes. might think, I've made it. And I remember my, my friend Ira Gold, who, who's in the National Symphony. Oh, yeah. Said, I know hey, him. Yeah, I, his yeah. wife's a violist. Oh, yes. My Heidi. World. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he said, like, this is, like, way early days of the podcast. But he said, it's like you're just walking through a door. It's a whole different world. And you think about everything differently. And it's just, and and it's, and, you know, I think people who are in school, they might think, like, oh, I finally made it. And it's like, no, this you're just this is just like a part of your life now and um mm -hmm. but it's interesting to think about like how one ends up on viola or ends up on bass like most people don't start on bass or most stage parents don't send their kids to bass you know right. um and and then even from an uh, but but and i was at a music festival a couple of years ago and we were all sitting around the table and it's like how'd you get into bass heavy metal 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 everybody was like some random things oh, happened and then i ended up on bass and you know it, it's it's interesting talking to people who make it to pro the professional level on the violin that is rarely the case it's like oh i was a heavy metal guitarist <laughs> right. and 16 i picked up the violin and i'm playing in in chicago symphony or whatever but i, I um you know bass is one of those instruments you can like the principal bass here in san francisco he started playing at 18. he was like a yeah that's yeah. the thing about bass. Typically, most of them start later. Yeah. And it's, you know, all the violins start when they were four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the violas started when they're about 10 and, or it started, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting that it can, yeah. yeah, that you can do that. Plus, I don't know. Are, do they have teeny tiny little basses for a Suzuki bass? They probably do now. I don't know. They do now. <laughs> and we're now getting to the generation of people who have, but it's pretty new. Uh, but we're just starting to get to the generation of people that, conceivably did start like real young like nina de caesar is a bassist in baltimore now she was in oregon before and she started bass like super young ted botsford who's in the la phil also there's this great teacher actually in the dc area uh george vance he kind of melded suzuki and and the raboth technique and, mm -hmm. and he was actually this this uh, we're going down another nerdy rabbit hole but this is um um he was his books were originally going to be the suzuki base books and then he had a falling out with the suzuki association mm -hmm. and so he said i'm just going to take my books and do my own thing yeah. 
Yeah, so he sort of like caused a lot of confusion for for the, because then then this then Suzuki started their own base books, which initially I think most people think weren't as good. So, um, but but you, this generate there are is a generation that's that's now has started young, but still it's not that common and i'm sure in the mm -hmm. viola world you have that what must be at least kind of annoying a story of like i was like a pretty good violinist at juilliard and then i moved over to viola and i was crushing yeah. it and i know i know yes <laughs> that's a we don't like yeah we don't like those stories but right. I, 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 I fully <laughs> understand I fully, yeah well i mean we i guess the viola went through a similar thing where for you know forever the viola was either you know bad violinist or just like not primarily violists. And now then you had, you know, you primrose and all those people. And then you, ha you had people who seriously played the viola and then people who have started and only played viola. I mean, so it's, I mean, those kinds of jokes I like to think aren't really applicable anymore. However, right. right. Um, no, it's a holdover from <laughs> earlier days. <laughs> yes, for sure. Well, you know, it's, I've always wondered, like that, that sort of violinist becoming violist. You'd, you'd, one might think that would happen in the cello world to bass, but I rarely hear that move. Much more frequently, I hear bassists picking up the cello just to like try something new or to play something different. And mm -hmm. um, but it, that doesn't seem bass doesn't seem that attractive to most <laughs> most cellists I know. Anyway, yeah, I I can see the bass thing. I mean who wouldn't want to play in a band and then yeah. and then as you got more into it i know also at, at vcu all the jazz bass players have to take at least i think a year of classical bass mm -hmm. you know just so they can be flexible i think that's pretty good but i mean i play fiddle i don't play violin i yeah. play fiddle and that's mainly just for fun because it's it's playing is i don't know you can play with other people very easily and you know really it it's just not a it's not as much, I wouldn't say it's not as much fun. It's just a very different thing. So fiddle is kind of my fun band thing to do. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> well, you know, I, I started on violin and then I moved over to bass, the typical bass player story and heavy metal was involved along the way with the track. But then when I started teaching full time, I initially tried to demonstrate for the classroom on bass. And I realized this is not a good idea because I would either have to say, hold on and go to the back of the orchestra and then everybody would try to turn around and see mm -hmm. my bow, or I'd try to keep a bass up front. And then I I think the first day someone tripped on it, I realized that was a bad idea. So I, I started to practice the violin again. Oh, and really? I, yeah, and I'm, I'm certainly, I, I'm, I'm not going to be putting any uh, videos online of me playing violin anytime soon, but I got back into it and got my vibrato going and got around. And, and then a really depressing thing started to happen, which was like my brain started to work faster on violin than bass. I was like, I was like, oh, no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> not, I was still not good, but there was something about the physicality of only having two notes in a position before you're there to shift or change strings versus like all of a sudden it's like oh mm -hmm. d, d major oh third you know uh, yeah. and i just thought it was really interesting to um have that happen and so i would i would crash the first violin section every once in a while the assistant conductor would take over and like if it was sleigh ride i'd pop in the back of the section yeah. and i was like really confident and i had pretty l forceful sound but my intonation was a little <laughs> bit of a, a of a force to be reckoned with <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> like I can see, you know, if you want to get pl kids to play bass, I mean, how fun would it be to like play pop and jazz and salsa and all that stuff? And then like you, it's almost like a the perfect gateway to getting to recruiting bass players. <laughs> yeah, it's you know? it's it bass. I I found I I think bass can be a pretty easy recruit, but then the danger mm -hmm. is that it can be boring if you're well, not. That's in true. Yes. And I found myself as a director. I I thought I'm never going to neglect those bases up there. But what was I doing? I neglected them like crazy because then you realize it's like oh we have problems in the first violence. Yeah. And, and well, like, that's a yeah, point, you know, yeah. yeah, it's like, if we don't have that, this ship's not going to sail. And yeah. so then I look back and I see the drool <laughs> coming out of the bass player's mouth. And so, I, and, and, you know, band, band uh, conductors run the same thing. And I've learned some things from the band world, which is like, enlist the percussion section and everything. Get some group, because that's, that, mm -hmm. that's the equivalent of the bass section back there. And, and so I would try to like, get, you know, make the basses seem really important and play. And, and like, viola was 
one of those things I, I I was very lucky in that we had some one of the middle school teachers was just really good at getting kids well she was a violist that was probably why but uh -huh. she, she would always send strong violas so we never that was never really a, a problem thankfully but yay it can be a, excellent yeah well at the summer um the summer camp or that we have at, at, it's a partnership between Richmond Symphony and VCU, but everyone in the intensive program plays chamber music in addition, and they always do bass quartets or something because you know it really gives them something to do than mm -hmm. I don't know like doubling a cello part in something. Yeah, I, it, I do have. Oh, go sorry. ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say I I anytime we're playing something fast like Mozart and we have you know violas, cellos, and basses in unison going. And I'm like, man, I have four fingers to do this. And I can't imagine how the bases are just like, they just must be all over. And well, well we're, we're not doing it very easily. Like like this trombone concert I was talking about. It is like, be, that, like everybody in the bass section walked in backstage and everybody said the same thing. 167. This was happening on Saturday. We had a rehearsal. 167. We're not going to do 167. Guess what tempo we're going? At least 167. I've never seen a professional orchestra uh, so close to revolt. <laughs> Although it's one of their colleagues playing. So I know, you know, when, but like, you know. I, I like, know, but it's so demoralizing when it's like, written in such a way that you know it's just almost not possible and and no matter how much you practice and i find that just so demoralizing <laughs> yeah it's it makes for a stressful uh a stressful um yeah so i i don't know how i wouldn't i certainly wouldn't want a mic on me uh, this week at 167 but i know oh i'm not the only one <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, well, thanks yeah. for chatting. It's yeah. So thanks for asking me. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Um, I, I, and, and we, it's always a small world in these podcasts, but say hi to Susanna for me. I will. And if I find myself in your neck of the woods, I'll, I'll oh. be sure to let you know. And likewise. Oh, please do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. I'll try to, well, here, I'll, uh, uh, so we, I, I'll send people to the book. I can send people to your website. Anywhere else you want me to send people? or um no yeah, website the book is good if people want to um i'm curious about how if people are using this and they're teaching how they're using it it'd be cool if they write and you have a comment section i yep. think yeah. if they want to write how they're using it that'd be really interesting for other people to see and for me to see because i but uh, you know if they liked it write a comment if not never mind <laughs> 